Unto us a child is born. Isaiah 9 verse 1 to 7. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the days of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, in order to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from that time forward, even forevermore, for the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. This is the word of God. Isaiah is a mini Bible in its structure. Like the Bible, Isaiah is 66 chapters, like the 66 books of the Bible. And it's in two main sections. 39 chapters in the first section, like the Old Testament, is 39 books. And 27 chapters in the second section of Isaiah, like the New Testament, has 27 chapters or books. The Old Testament opens with God's case against man because of his sin. Isaiah opens in the same way. The first section closes with the prophecy of the coming king, the king of righteousness and the redemption of Israel, just as the prophets close the Old Testament with predictions of his coming kingdom. The second part of Isaiah, starting in chapter 40, opens with the voice of him who cries in the wilderness, obviously referring to John the Baptist and is concerned with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The New Testament also opens with John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, preparing his way. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Isaiah ends with a vision of new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell righteousness. The New Testament closes with the same way in Revelation. The striking similarity between Isaiah and the whole Bible is actually unforgettable once it's pointed out to you. Isaiah 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, there shall be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali were the first of the provinces to fall to the Syrian invasion. God sends distress upon disobedient nations. For the guilty, there is gloom. God judges nations. He humbles the proud. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. God is merciful. God intervenes in history. He works salvation and deliverance. This is what grace means, undeserved favor. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This prophecy, of course, had its fulfillment when God himself, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, appeared and preached the gospel in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali and Galilee of the Gentiles. In fact, most of our Lord's ministry was in Galilee. His time in Jerusalem was just the last week of his life, really, on earth. In the most unexpected places, at the least expected times, God intervenes. Even the worst of times, God's people have a comfort. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Knocked down, but not knocked out. Post tenebras lux. You'll see that at the Franschuk Huguenot Monument, and it's also the motto of Geneva, and it's written into the wall of the Geneva Wall Reformation Monument. After the darkness, light. Where sin increased, God's grace increased much more. 
No matter how dark things may become, God's light shines brighter. All the darkness cannot put out that light, which is why the resistance to communism in Eastern Europe began with a Leipzig prayer meeting with a single candle. And then they would light and more and more candles, and people would get home and they'd put the candle in the windowsill of an open window, all lights off in the building, just making this stand. All the darkness of communism and atheism cannot put out the single candle of one Christian's faith. I form the light and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. When the gospel comes to any place, light comes. A great light. Those who live in darkness, those outside of Christ have no God, no forgiveness, no salvation, no hope, no heaven, only darkness and despair. What does atheism and evolution have to offer you? You came from nothing, you're going nowhere, life is meaningless. What do they have to celebrate at Christmas? Isaiah 9 verse 3, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. The nation of Israel had been severely judged and diminished. It had just lost the lands of Naphtali and Zebulun. Yet the word of God came through Isaiah to comfort his people and to reassure them that despite the present traumatic cutting off and diminishing of the nation, yet the time will come when God himself will enlarge the nation and increase their joy. Everyone rejoiced over success, achievement, prosperity, as at a harvest, or gaining a victory, such as receiving a gift or dividing plunder, God's intervention will accomplish salvation, salvation of his people. He will achieve redemption to those to whom he grants the gifts of faith and repentance. He will bless his children with the greatest gifts ever given, the forgiveness of sins, deliverance from the kingdom of darkness, entrance into the eternal kingdom of God, adoption into the family of God. And those who sow in tears will reap with joy. Isaiah 9 verse 4, For as in the day of Midian's defeat you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. The Lord has intervened. And he's ended the oppression of sin and Satan into our darkness. His light has shone. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, Christ quoted Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim salvation. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Release to the oppressed. Isaiah 9, verse 5. Every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. The wicked will be judged. Those who oppress God's people will be destroyed. The message of Christmas is not only a message of God's love for his people, but it's also a message of his wrath against sin. And maybe that's sometimes left out of the message of Christmas. We see here not only his mercy, but as justice. He saves, but he also judges. The message of the cradle includes the message of the cross and of the crown. The wood of the cradle should remind us of the wood of the cross. The message of Christmas of the cradle should include and emphasize the deity of Christ's incarnation. But the purpose of Christ's coming was the cross. He was born to die as an atonement for our sins. Yet the Saviour whose incarnation we remember at Christmas will come again as the eternal judge. We will all stand before his throne and we will have to give an account of our lives for everything we have done and everything we have said. Unless we have turned to God in faith and repented of our sins, we will be condemned. If our lives have not borne the fruit of obedience, we too will be destined to burning. I don't think the whole context of Isaiah 9 verse 6 is often given at Christmas, but that's the chapter in which we find the key Christmas verse. Along with those guilty of innocent blood, we would be fuel for the fire. Then comes Isaiah 9 verse 6, the all-time most important Christmas verse. For unto us a child is born. Everyone loves the birth of a child. Well, 
almost everyone. Of course, there's some who prefer abortion to birth. Instead of life, they choose death. There are those. But most of us find a newborn child cute. That is why most people celebrate Christmas. A babe in a manger is so unthreatening, so harmless. However, some atheists do feel threatened by unto us a child is born. Every Christmas season, the Antichrist Lawsuit Union, ACLU, institutes lawsuits against public manger scenes in America. And there's radical humanists in South Africa who also look forward to opportunities when they can try to banish all public expressions of the Christian faith. Perhaps they understand some of the immense implications of the baby in a manger. It is actually threatening to atheists and globalists and Satanists and those who've got an agenda. The God of the ages lying in a feeding trough in a stable. Not born in a palace, not born in a temple, not even born in a home, but outside of human habitation, in the cold amongst farm animals without normal sanitation. Who would want their child born in a stable? It, it may sound cute when you sing about it, but actually it's not, it's, it's a picture of something wrong. Why is a baby being born in a stable amongst farm animals and laid in a trough, a feeding trough for animals? Why is there not proper hygiene? Why is there, it's, it's not actually right, is it? It just shows. He came into his own, his own did not receive him. But aside from neurotic atheists, most people feel drawn to the story of a baby born in a manger with angels singing and shepherds kneeling and wise men bringing gifts. It seems nice and sweet and cute, but the verse does not stop with that. It goes on to, for unto us a son is giving. Now this is getting more threatening. We're no longer worshipping a babe in a cradle. He is the son of God who died on a cross. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Notice capital G, the government will be upon his shoulders. This is getting more threatening. This is why Herod, the king, declared war in the womb. He understood the menace of the manger. There was no room for God in the world that he had made. Where is the one who's been born king? We have come to worship him, said the wise men. Now, Herod felt that his selfish lifestyle and his comfortable position and his political position was threatened by this newborn babe. Gripped by selfishness and a lust for power, Herod sought to murder the Messiah by massacring all still in the manger in Bethlehem. Centuries before, Pharaoh had sought to slaughter all newborn Hebrew boys in Egypt. And today we have Pharaohs and Herods waging a similar war on the womb. Christ was not born a prince. He was not born an heir to the throne. He's the only one who's ever been born a king. No one's born a king. You might be born an heir or a prince, but you cannot be born a king, but Jesus was born a king. And the government, capital G, will be upon his shoulders. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is sovereign. He is the final authority. In Eastern Europe, the communist authorities back in the Cold War before the Iron Curtain collapsed, they allowed prayer in the churches, but not in the schools. You could preach piety, but not the Lordship of Christ in all areas of life. Jesus could be Savior of your soul, maybe, but not Lord of your mind, certainly not of your life or your home or your work or community or city or country. When the Bible speaks of the government, capital G, it is always talking about God's sovereign government. He is the one who makes brings the seasons, determines when we're born, when we die. God is the government, ultimately, in terms of the stars, the planets, the way everything works. He is the government, capital G. We are unbiblical when we attribute sovereign powers to civil authorities. How obnoxious that so many Christians put capital G for government, even the government, capital G, referring to a bunch of pagans who hate God. But they put small g for gospel. Capital S for state, small s for saviour. There's something wrong with that kind of subconscious idolatry or statism. Civil governments are God's servant. That's what deacon means. That's what minister means. A cabinet minister is meant to be a cabinet servant. Prime minister, first servant. Civil governments are meant to be the servant of God and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. That's what Romans 13 tells us. 
1 Peter 2, 14, we learn that governors are sent by God to punish those who do wrong. This is well encapsulated in this beautiful painting in Switzerland called Justice Lifts the Nations. And this is in the Palace of Justice in Lausanne in Switzerland. And here you have the city fathers looking to Lady Justice for wisdom. In front, you see the people arguing their cases, presenting their petitions, and the sheriffs are standing with double-handed swords waiting to execute the decision of the magistrates who are looking to Lady Justice, who, unlike justice in America, Lady Justice in America always seems to be blindfolded. I don't know, the Americans seem to like blindfolded Lady Justice. But in Europe, all the Lady Justice statues I've seen, they aren't blindfolded. I feel much happier having a justice who's got their eyes open, but they're always holding scales of justice, weigh the evidence, and they've got a sword. Sometimes swords pointing upwards, normally it's pointing upwards, but not in this painting. In this painting in Lausanne, Switzerland, the sword is pointed downwards into an open book which says on it, Holy Bible. The word of God is the foundation of justice. And so justice lifts the nations as justice must weigh the evidence in accordance with the principles of God's word. And the city fathers must look to these biblical principles and the sheriffs must apply the law in accordance with these judgments. Jesus declared to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, you would have no authority of me unless it had been given to you from above. This is the message of the manger. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord of all. He is Lord over all aspects of life. He is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. As Zion 9 verse 6 says, And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I hope we've all heard this pounded out at Handel's Messiah. And that resonates with us. Wonderful Counselor. He is all-knowing. He embraces absolute wisdom. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He hears our prayers and he guides his people. Mighty God. He is all-powerful. He is God himself. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. The incarnation of God. He is fully God and fully man, light from light. Ask the Jehovah's Witnesses who come to your door, or the unbelieving Jews, or liberal theologians, explain this verse, the most famous verse in the world regarding Christmas. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. How do you explain this verse? It's obviously referring to Christ. How could you deny the deity of Christ in the light of Isaiah 9 verse 6? Everlasting Father, he is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. As a father is compassionate, he cares and he provides for and protects his children. Prince of Peace, there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. Those politicians who think that they can achieve peace without Christ are deluded. The United Nations has attributed a messianic psalm, well, prophecy from Isaiah, and put it at the front of the United Nations building. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and neither shall nation make war against one another. And they think they can do this? They can't even bring peace to Bosnia or Somalia. And they think they can bring peace to the world? The United Nations are seriously deluded. Only in Christ can we find true and lasting peace. That's true as individuals, as families, congregations, communities, countries, continents. Isaiah 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He shall reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. The ultimate victory and triumph of Christ's kingdom is inevitable. There's nothing on earth that can stop it. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All kings will bow down to him. All nations will serve him. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will endure forever. Martin Luther says, this is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. When we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're praying for Satan's will to be frustrated, defeated, and smashed. When you pray for God's kingdom to come, you're praying for all those kingdoms that oppose God to be defeated, destroyed, smashed, removed. 
The nations at every shore will worship him. Everyone in its own land. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testament to all nations. And then the end will come. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. This is what the Great Commission calls us to. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto Christ. Therefore we must go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all things that the Lord has commanded us. There is no authority that is not under Christ. This is what it means to pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Isaiah 11 verse 9 declares, the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, this isn't as the waters cover the earth. 70% of the world is covered by water. This is as the waters cover the sea, which is pretty much 100%. How much of the sea is covered in water? Pretty much 100%. The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every enemy of God, they will have to bow. The question isn't, will they bow to Christ, but when will they bow to Christ? They can bow to him as Savior today, or as Lord and eternal judge then, but every knee will bow. This is the message of Christmas. Not only of the crib, but of the cross. Not only of the cross, but also of the crown. At Christmas, we celebrate the advent of the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, holy, glorious creator God coming into this universe. Christmas begins with Christ. The first recorded reactions to the birth of Christ was from the shepherds who returned, glorifying and praising God for the things that they had heard. Simeon took up Jesus in his arms and blessed God. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. You rejoice that a child has been born. But do you recognize that he is Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God? Do you submit to his government? Do you obey him as Lord of your life? Is he your wonderful counselor? Is he your mighty God? Is he your everlasting father? Is he the Prince of Peace in your life? If so, rejoice. His government will never end. His kingdom will endure forever. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.